Okay, thanks, thanks. Right, uh, welcome everybody. I'm Duncan Barry. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Socialist History Society. Um, we're really pleased to have Andrew Whitehead speaking to us on his new book, uh, Devilish Kind of Courage, uh, on uh, Latvian anarchists and others in the East End of London uh, before the First World War, um, including the famous Sydney Street Siege. Um, Andrew is probably familiar to many of you. He's written much uh, on the history of anarchism, as well as a book on Kashmir, if I remember correctly, um, and uh, has been involved in uh, the Anarchist uh, Studies Journal and the editorial board, and also uh, many years back uh, on in History Workshop Journal. Um, I actually knew Andrew, we just worked out over 50 years ago because we were at university together and even did some of the same courses in the same year. Um, and we've been in touch on and off since. So I'm really pleased uh, to have Andrew joining us. Um, the arrangement is, is that Andrew uh, will talk. I think he's got some slides to show us. Uh, and then there'll be room for questions and comments uh, at, after Andrew's finished. But we let our speakers uh, talk without interruption. Um, but you can put comments in chat. But preferably uh, leave that, that till after Andrew's finished. Otherwise, he and I will be somewhat distracted trying to follow the chat. Um, so over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Duncan. And thank you to Steve as well. And thank you to all of you at the Socialist History Society. I'm also uh, a member of the society, mm -hmm. actually a member of longstanding, although yeah, yeah. Uh, not one of the more high profile members. Um, I'm going to be talking about particularly the Siege of Sydney Street in 1911. Uh, the source material I've used is, above all, the City of London police records at the London Metropolitan Archives, which were actually salvaged when they were intended for um, trashing by a serving City of London police officer half a century ago. He saved everything, and everything is now in the LMA, and it's a treasure trove. It includes just everything, including the items that the police seized when they were searching the homes of suspects. But I've also used a little bit of oral history, which I happened to do about uh, 30 years or more ago, which touches on Sydney Street, uh, press reports, fire brigade reports, um, and press reports, uh, including uh, uh, some of the articles in the Rabita Freint, the Yiddish language anarchist journal, which had a print run of 4,000 in London. At this stage, I am going to share my screen so I can show you a PowerPoint presentation. This is always a moment of truth because when I press this button, I'm not quite sure exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but somebody I'm sure will shout if you lose me. I'm hoping that you can now see a PowerPoint slide. Yeah, good. So that's um, all that. Thank you. And this is this is the cover of my book, a Devilish Kind of Courage, which is a quote from actually the Daily Chronicles reporting of the Siege of Sydney Street. Nothing of the sort had been seen within living memory in quiet, law abiding, comfortable England. That's how Winston Churchill described the Siege of Sydney Street. And while the lyrical style may be somewhat off putting in substance, he was right. What happened at Sydney Street in Stepney on the 3rd of January 1911 was the most sensational shootout in London's history. Two gunmen, Fritz Svars, who was a Latvian anarchist, and William Sokolov, who was a Russian with no clear political loyalty, managed to keep armed police and army sh sharpshooters at bay for fully six hours. In total, it's likely that more than a thousand bullets were fired. And this followed on directly from an attempted robbery on a jeweller's in Houndstitch in the city of London, uh, which ended in what remains the most grievous incident uh, in the history of London police, with three police officers shot dead and two seriously wounded. The siege of Sydney Street. Right. No, I, I, right. I had a. The, the Siege of Sydney Street. I hope you're seeing a, a, a journal which says the battle with the London anarchists. Yeah. Uh, caused a sensation. 
it came just as new technology allowed the rise of cheap mass circulation daily papers, which were able to use action photographs, not simply portrait photos and line drawings. This penny pull together of uh, reporting and photos of the siege was published by the News Chronicle, the Daily Chronicle group, within three days of the incident, and it sold enormously. The siege was also captured by a brand new news platform, the Newsreel, which had only been going in uh, in the UK for a matter of months. Five Newsreel cam camera operators rushed to Sydney Street and managed to film some of the action. Three of their films survive. Uh, some of it's available on YouTube, and some of their footage was being shown in cinemas in London on the evening of the siege, within hours of the denouement. Uh, of course, Winston Churchill, there he is with his uh, silk top hat, um, famously went to the scene of the shootout. He was Home Secretary at the time in a Liberal government. He saw himself as uh, a reforming Home Secretary. He was still only 35. And he was a former soldier, a former war correspondent, uh, somebody who prided himself on being a man of action. And when at the Home Office he was unable to find out very much about what was happening in the East End, he decided he would go and see for himself. Um, in so doing, he completely appended the operational chain of command. Nobody was clear who was in charge. And although Churchill said he was not there to direct operations, he was clearly heard giving orders. Uh, and he later admitted that he had been rash to go and his curiosity got the better of him. But apart from the two gunmen, he was almost certainly the only person present who was familiar with the formidable weapon that the gunmen used. And that was principally uh, a Mauser semi-automatic pistol, which was known as the broom handle. Churchill had not only used a Mauser broom handle while in the army in Sudan, he'd also killed with it. Um, the other name most associated with the Siege of Sydney Street uh, is that of Peter the Painter. Uh, something of a, an East End anti-hero. There are even blocks of flats named after him. There's a Peter House and a Painter House at the south end of Sydney Street. Um, he was a Latvian, an anarchist, probably a key figure in the group responsible for the robbery attempt, but he was not present either at the robbery in Houndsditch or in Sydney Street. So all these myths about the man who... Uh, evaporated from Sydney Street as the police besieged the building are exactly that, they're myths. Uh, but the police knew quite a lot about him. This is a photograph that the London police managed to get from police in Marseille. Uh, a very, I mean, as you can see, what a well-groomed guy. Uh, uh, I mean, well coiffured with a stylish moustache, uh, wearing suit and tie. This is clearly a portrait photo. Um, and it rather challenges the conventional notion of the Edwardian era anarchist as scruffy and down at heel. By and large, the Latvians who were responsible for the acts of violence I'm talking about were um, a very, a, a very style conscious group. Um, the nom de guerre of Peter the Painter was almost certainly devised by the London police. It was devised by a Russian-speaking police officer uh, who was transcribing uh, evidence from a witness. And to make this Peter stand out from other Peters, he was at the time using a pseudonym of Peter Piatko, he devised this sort of nom de guerre of Peter the Painter, which clearly bears an echo of Jack the Ripper. And there's no doubt that the name and the alliteration of it uh, gave uh, explains a great deal of Peter the Painter's profile in East End mythology and indeed the attention that was given to the siege of Sydney Street. Uh, the police did find out his real name. It took them quite a while, but by the end of 1912, they knew his real name, which was Janis Zaklis. They knew the location of the family f uh, farm in Latvia. They didn't know exactly where he was, he was believed to be at that date in Germany, but they had no evidence to either convict or extradite. So basically, the police pretended they didn't know who he was. 
And to this day, the London police has never publicly acknowledged that they know the name of Peter the Painter. I've got to, to explain Sydney Street and Houndsditch. I have to say a little bit about uh, what was happening in Latvia in the first decade of the last century. This is a wonderfully atmospheric photograph of a group of Latvian anarchists photographed in Latvia, uh, which was sent by, London, uh, by uh, the British consul in the Latvian capital, Riga, to the London police in the aftermath of the siege of Sydney Street. Um, two of this group at least had spent time in London and one of them, the guy that has a one next to his head, um, was at least on the fringes of the group responsible for the Houndsditch robbery attempt and for the siege of Sydney Street. Um, it tells you quite a lot about uh, the anarchists in Latvia, uh, quite well educated, again, quite stylishly dressed, a significant number of women among them. Um, Latvia was one of the more prosperous corners of the Russian Empire, and Riga and Liepeja were quite busy uh, industrial ports. In 1905, uh, when revolution started in St. Petersburg early in the year, it spread rapidly to Riga, uh, where large crowds took to the streets, supporting an end to Tsarist rule, and also staking a claim on Latvia's national identity. Um, uh, the principal demonstration in Riga uh, met with volleys of gunfire, prompting many of the demonstrators to flee on the ice covered local river, a very broad river. The ice couldn't bear their weight, and it's believed that more than 200 of the demonstrators drowned while trying to escape from police firing. And that helped to set the tone of uh, both the revolutionary movement in Latvia and of the cycle of violent Tsarist repression, which again turn and turn around, prompted increasing levels of militancy from the young Latvians. So the Latvian leftist movement, which in 1905 was mainly social democratic, um, and I'm using social democratic in the way it would have been used at that time, meaning Marxist, um, a lot of the young Latvians resorted to using weapons because they found that weapons were being used against them. And in the aftermath of the 1905 failed revolution in Latvia, uh, the Tsarist authorities sent the Cossacks in, who were brutal in uh, staging reprisals on suspected revolutionaries, of using torture, of executions, and of sexual violence, which again encouraged the Latvian revolutionaries to be even more militant in their resort to armed violence, and to the staging of armed robberies to sustain their own movement, and to help the families of political prisoners. Um, by the end of 1906, it's likely that about two and a half thousand young Latvians were political exiles living in London, in Germany, in France, and in the United States. Peter the Painter spent time in both France and the United States before he came to London uh, in 1910. Um, Uh, Peter the Painter and various others were also uh, moved from being social democrats to a loose allegiance to anarchism uh, because they regarded uh, the anarchist movement as more militant, as more indulgent to revolutionary expropriation, and at a time when the social democrats were toying with the idea of contesting elections, the anarchists were always clear that they wanted to be completely outside electoral politics. Um, most of the Latvian uh, uh, anarchist emigres were not Jewish, but when they moved to London, they tended to congregate in the Jewish East End, where there was already a well-established anarchist movement. Uh, you can see the masthead there of Der Arbeiter Freit, Rudolf Rocker's paper, and beneath is a group photograph of Rudolf Rocker, the German Gentile, who was the leader of the Yiddish speaking movement, he's the guy with tousled hair and round glasses uh, with his hand 
on the uh, jacket of his sister-in-law. Um, the Arbeiterfreund was a remarkably successful venture. The paper sold, uh, had a print run of 4,000 each week in the East End. Almost all of it sold uh, in London, a little bit in Leeds, Manchester, Glasgow. Um, and the, the movement also sponsored uh, local trade unions and it had premises. So in 1906, it took over a disused church building on Jubilee Street, a large building, and it used that uh, to print its paper, but it was also big enough to have a lecture room with a capacity of several hundred, a library and a cafe. Uh, and it made the decision that that club, the Jubilee Street Club, would not serve alcohol, which meant that it was able to be open to all. If the club had been light, uh, had been uh, serving alcohol, then it would its premises would be only open to club members. But the whole ethos of the club was it was open to all. The workers' friend and Rudolf Rocker disapproved of revolutionary expropriation. They disapproved of armed robberies. They disapproved of the use of guns. Uh, but their club was where the Latvian anarchists gathered, socialized, read papers, went to concerts. It was their gathering point. Um, and without uh, the Jubilee Street Club and that movement, it would have been very diff difficult for them to operate in the way that they did. Um, there were probably a number of armed robberies by Latvian and Russian anarchists in London that we can't pinpoint their responsibility. Uh, but we do know that it was mainly Latvians who were responsible for the attempt to break into this uh, Harris's jewellery shop in Houndsditch in December 1910. Uh, the items in the safe of this uh, shop were worth, in today's value, around about a million pounds. Uh, there'd been previous incidents which we do know about. So two Latvians had stage a wages robbery on a rubber factory in Tottenham in uh, 1909. Uh, it wasn't very well organized and uh, the location wasn't very clever. It was immediately opposite Tottenham police station and section house. So um, when the uh, two anarchists managed to snatch uh, the wages bag, they found that they were being pursued, quite literally pursued on foot by uh, police, uh, and also workers at the rubber factory and a whole host of uh, hangers-on. Um, and in the end, uh, the anarchists who were armed shot dead one police officer and one nine-year-old boy, and both themselves suffered fatal injuries. Um, it's almost certain that there was also an attempt by Latvians to uh, rob a bank in Motherwell near uh, Glasgow as well, around about the same time. Um, but this is Harris's jewellery shop in Houndsditch, and this is the street uh, that was immediately behind it. This is Exchange Buildings. Um, these are three-storey uh, uh, buildings, commercial on the ground floor, residential on the upper floors, with just one room per floor. So they're tall, but they're very small. They're, the, the actual footprint is very small. Um, Houndsditch as we're looking at this, was would be on just out of shot on the left. Uh, so the uh, the Latvians who were regarded themselves as the Lisma group, Lisma means flame in Latvian, hired uh, a premises and exchange building on the left, just beyond where you can see the gas lamp, because that building they believe backed on to Harris's jeweler shop. And their idea was that they were going to bury through from the back wall of this building into Harris's jewellery shop and basically crack the safe and get away with, as I say, almost a million pounds worth of goods. This was quite a sophisticated attempt. Uh, the Latvians had got cutting equipment and they had got... Uh, 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 a canister of oxygen 
uh, actually supplied unwittingly by the Italian anarchist uh, Enrico Malatesta, who had an engineering workshop uh, in Islington. And they also timed it quite cleverly. This was then a Jewish area. The business that they were trying to break in was Jewish run. And it was the business was completely closed on the Sabbath. They started trying to burrow into the jewelry shop on a Friday evening, believing they would have probably about 30 hours before the shop opened again on Sunday morning. However, the whole area was quiet on a Friday evening because of the start of the Jewish Sabbath, which meant that the digging and picking away at the back wall of the jeweler's shop became very audible to the people who lived in this area, one of whom got very suspicious at around about 10 o'clock, half past 10 at night, and went to look for a police officer. A policeman came round, knocked on the door of exchange buildings, realising that was where the name came from, uh, and rather peculiarly asked when the door was opened, is the missus in? I think he just was short of anything to say. And when a heavily accented voice said no, uh, this guy realised actually there was something suspicious going on and went away to report to his uh, senior officer at Bishopsgate Police Station. A little less than an hour later, nine police officers, none of them, of course, armed, staked out around this building, exchange buildings, and the, a sergeant again knocked on the floor, uh, on the door of the house in exchange buildings. Uh, the door was opened. The sergeant stepped in one or two steps and was met by a hail of bullets. Um, there were probably three people from inside exchange buildings, part of the robbery gang, who opened fire on the police officers and then ran out into the yard and kept on firing, um, with the result that two police sergeants and a police constable were shot dead and two others were seriously injured and never resumed police duties. As I said, it was and remains the worst single incident in the history of London's police, and the dead police officers had a funeral service at St Paul's with Winston Churchill in attendance. And many memorial cards were issued of this sort uh, in tribute to the police officers who died in the execution of their duty. Um, in the confusion, one of the gunmen was also shot by his comrades, George Gardstein. Uh, he wasn't killed outright. Uh, two of the gang supported him as if he was a Friday night drunk back to a room in Whitechapel. The room in Whitechapel was part of two rooms which were shared by Peter the Painter and Fritz Fars and Fritz Fars's partner, Luba Milstein. Um, Gardstein, Gardstein died in that Whitechapel room the next morning, and this is a post-mortem photograph issued by the police as they tried to get uh, this guy's name and more information. It took them a week to work out where George Gardstein actually lived, even though that was less than a mile away from the place where his body was found. Special Branch didn't seem to be very up to the mark in the information they had about the Latvian and Russian anarchists who were operating in London. Under Gardstein's mattress was a semi-automatic weapon. In his room, police found ammunition. They also found anarchist literature and letters and photographs. Uh, and some of these letters and photographs were, as the police arrived, being burnt in the next room by a woman accomplice. One of the photographs they got later from George Gardstein's room in Stepney is this one. This is Gardstein, um, well over six foot. Even the police commented in court how handsome a man he was. And this was one of, uh, well, this could be a sister, but my guess is it's almost certainly a, a girlfriend or partner. Um, in the City of London Police Archives, there are dozens of photographs like this, as, as I mentioned, almost all unlabeled. But you do get the sense of swagger about Gardstein. Um, and Arthur Harding, 
who was a notorious East End criminal, when he was interviewed by um, uh, Raphael Samuel um, a generation ago about his criminal activity, talked about Gardstein and the gang of which these Latvian anarchists were part and the way in which they always walked down Brick Lane in the centre of the road. They always had good looking women with them. There was a certain there was a certain cockiness to the way in which this this gang besported themselves. Um, in the aftermath of uh, the uh, Houndsditch robbery and the murder of the three policemen, almost all the key members of that anarchist group who were able to fled or went to ground. Peter the painter almost certainly managed to get a sea passage out to uh, to uh, Netherlands within a day or two. But two of the gang, Fritz Svars, uh, Latvian, and William Sokolov, a Russian watchmaker, actually uh, hid out in a second floor room at 100 Sydney Street, which was the room of Betsy Gershon, who had been Sokolov's lover. This was just about 100 yards away from the anarchist club in Jubilee Street. So all this is happening within a very limited uh, geographical area. So for it looks seems for about two weeks, Svars and Sokolov, along with Betty Gershon, um, hid themselves away in this room in Sydney Street with a police hue and cry all around them, aware that there were detectives in just about all the East End streets looking out for the suspects. Um, but managed even to hide to the extent that the other people in the house were unaware of their presence. Um, after a couple of weeks, Fritz Svars wrote a letter to his family back in Latvia, um, giving his own account of what had happened to him, not admitting guilt in the in the killing of the police officers, but clearly with a sort of premonition that he was not going to survive. In this letter in Latvian, he says, two weeks I've been on the run. How much longer I can manage, I don't know. To leave soon doesn't bear thinking about because they're guarding all the roads intensely. I'm not at all depressed because everyone knows that one has to die at some time. Uh, the letter and lever reached his family in Latvia because the person he gave it to, to send back to the Baltic, uh, was a police informer and told the police where Spars and Sokolov were hiding and passed over the letter to the police. This letter is still in the City of London police files. Uh, it was only last October that a copy of that letter reached its intended recipients as far as family in Latvia by an amazing coincidence, the person I was using to help translate some uh, Latvian inscriptions uh, on a visit back to Riga uh, was chatting to a friend and that friend said, you're doing a book about anarchists in London? Well, one of my family was one of them. And actually the woman on the right here, Margarita, is the great granddaughter of Fritz Svars's sister, Olga and Liana on the left is her daughter. So I was able to take a copy of Fritz Fars's final letter back to Riga last October and give it to Margarita and Lena, who are neither proud nor ashamed of their forebears, but Margarita said, actually during Soviet rule, you couldn't admit to having an anarchist gunman among your forebears, uh, but now that the situation has changed, at least you can you could admit that actually you've got all sorts of interesting people in your family's past. Um, when the police were told that the two wanted men were in 100 Sydney Street, overnight they surrounded the building and they used hundreds of police officers to do so because they were worried not simply about uh, the gunmen escaping, they're also worried about crowds that would gather uh, and at first light or a bit before first light at seven o'clock in the morning a policeman walked up to the outside of 100 Sydney Street and threw gravel at the second window where they believed the two men were hiding out and the policeman was met by uh, gunfire 
And that's when the siege really got going. Uh, the police had issued some of their number with rifles and fairly basic pistols, probably about 20 or 30 armed police, um, some of them stationed in houses opposite, which you can tell are only two storey, uh, and the buildings on the left hand side are four storey. Um, but the police found that they were emphatically outgunned by the two Latvians, who at that stage had the run of the house. All the other residents had been uh, spirited away by the police before the siege began. And gunfire was coming uh, from 100 Sydney Street at different times from all four floors and from the front and from the back. So about 10 o'clock in the morning, after three hours of uh, gunfire, the police took the really quite exceptional step of asking permission to uh, seek help from the army. That hadn't been done for about 60 or 70 years, at least not in a, uh, uh, troops had not been, had not opened fire in London in support of the police for that length of time. And it didn't happen again until the Iranian embassy siege. Um, so the war office gave approval Winston Churchill as Home Secretary gave after the event approval and uh, police officers went to the Tower of London and asked for a detachment of Scots Guards to join them at Sydney Street and about 24 I think Scots Guards positioned themselves with rifles uh, on uh, prone on the ground on Sydney Street on both sides of the besieged house in buildings opposite and on the tower of a the bottling plant of a local brewery, so they had an elevated position. And still, the Latvian gunmen, or the two gunmen, Latvian and Russian, managed to hold out. And it wasn't until one o'clock in the afternoon, after six hours, that the balance started to change. By then, it's probable that the Latvians were running out of ammunition, um, but they certainly had a I mean, a really formidable uh, arsenal of bullets to fall back on, and in total, at least three semi-automatic pistols. But shortly after one o'clock, some plumes of smoke were detected coming from the besieged building. Nobody was quite clear why. Um, the fire brigade was called, probably by bystanders, when the fire brigade got to the scene, they were instructed by the police not to proceed further. They were initially told that the police were smoking out burglars, uh, but certainly the fire brigade was given the impression that the police had started the fire in 100 Sydney Street. When a more senior fire brigade officer arrived on the scene and challenged the police's instruction not to douse down the flames, he was instructed to go and talk to Winston Churchill. And the fire brigade officer did, and Winston Churchill very clearly said, you will not put out the flames. Let the building burn. Subsequently, the reason for that was given as the danger that the fire officers would be under. That wasn't quite clearly stated at the time. The following newspapers reported that the police had started the fire at 100 Sydney Street. The Home Office then denied that. And actually, given that public opinion wouldn't have worried too much if the fire had been started deliberately. There wasn't a great deal of public scrutiny about that aspect of the incident. But here you can see, um, after about an hour, at two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, all shooting from inside the building had stopped. Uh, the building was uh, uh, fully ablaze. Um, and the fire brigade were allowed to put up a ladder and start to douse down the flames. Um, it took them about 40 minutes to douse down the flames. Uh, and when uh, fire brigade officers entered through the back of the building on the ground floor, they eventually found uh, the remains of the two gunmen, both I mean, seriously charred. The inquest found that one of the gunmen had died from a bullet wound, presumably fired by either police or army, and the other had suffocated to death from smoke inhalation. Um, 
Churchill spent about uh, a good hour, maybe a little bit longer at the scene in Sydney Street, um, and clearly relished the sense of drama. He seems to have enjoyed risking himself by being a little bit more exposed to potential uh, gunfire than uh, would have been wise. Um, but in fact, although the gunmen, the, the Latvian and Russian, were very well armed, they didn't succeed in, uh, in inflicting any casualties of any consequence beyond uh, one policeman very early in the day who suffered serious um, uh, gunshot wounds and again was unable ever to return to work. Um, before the building got firmly ablaze uh, with, the, uh, with the police desperately anxious to make sure that the, the siege was ended before nightfall, which would have been about four o'clock at this time of year, they asked the army to bring in machine guns, a Maxim gun, as you can see in one of these postcards, and from St. John's Wood field artillery to be available in case it was needed against the two gunmen. In the event, neither machine gun nor artillery gun was used, but I'm fairly sure that this is the only time that security forces or uh, the army has set up machine guns and artillery guns in London against a civilian target. The reporting of the Siege of Sydney Street was dramatic and sensational. The Daily Mirror, which prided itself on being pictorially the most ambitious of the daily papers at that time, not only put a, a, a photograph of, of the siege all over its front page, on that edition, the following day, the 4th of January, it had 20 photographs, 20 photographs in that one edition from or about Sydney Street. And quite a few of the new tabloid papers were similarly um, uh, enthusiastic about their coverage of the incident. Um, but it also was the occasion of a profound and really corrosive uh, burst of anti-Semitism in the sensational press as well. The cartoon on the right was published in, in the Sunday People. Uh, the cartoonist E. Huskinson was quite well connected with the Conservative Party. It is appallingly anti-Semitic. You can see rats with Semitic features, all labelled undesirable alien, being driven out of a foreign country. There's an officially new uniform demanding clear out, and they're going through a gate called Aliens Act. In 1905, Britain had passed what was officially known as the Aliens Act, which was the first serious attempt to limit mass immigration into the country. What the people was arguing is that there were so many holes in the Aliens Act that people like the perpetrators of uh, the Houndstitch robbery attempt and those involved in Sydney Street, most of whom were not Jewish, had managed to get through get through the, the slats in the act. Uh, the people also published a, a doggerel poem which demanded the immediate expulsion from Britain of all Jews, all people professing the Jewish faith. This was the tone of the tabloid coverage. Um, there were loud demands for the, the Liberal government not only to tighten the Aliens Act, but also to uh, take steps to uh, limit the right of asylum. And I think it's rather to the credit of Asquith's Liberal government that he did neither. There was no restriction on the right of asylum, and although the government drafted legislation to slightly tighten the Aliens Act, it never saw the statute book because the government did, didn't give it sufficient time for it to reach uh, the statute. Um, the only policy change made in the aftermath of these incidents was a decision to uh, make sure that the London police had more effective firearms on those occasions when they needed to tackle uh, armed violence. Um, almost certainly the people who were responsible for killing the police officers at Houndstitch um, were either dead 
two of them in Sydney Street and one of them shot by his own comrades by accident, all had fled the country. But the police were under huge pressure to convict their accomplices. Um, and in the end, eight people were charged related to the robbery and shootings at uh, uh, the jewellers in Hamstitch. Only one of them was convicted, this woman, Nina Vasileva, Latvian, an anarchist, and the lover of George Gardstein, the member of the gang who'd been shot dead by his colleagues. She's a really interesting person. Um, she had really quite good English. She worked as a cigarette maker. Um, this, these are the, her police arrest photographs. You can tell there's a certain glower of defiance in the way that she looks at the camera. Uh, she was convicted uh, simply of um, abetting the robbery attempt at Houndsditch, not of the use of firearms, even though there was quite strong evidence that she was present at exchange buildings and was probably uh, accompanying uh, the injured George Gard Gardstein back to um, Peter the Painter's rooms in Whitechapel. Um, but remarkably, when the jury convicted her, they also added a rider to their verdict, asking the judge not to recommend her for deportation. And the judge agreed. He sentenced her to two years hard labor, but he did not recommend her to deportation, even though she was clearly a convicted felon of a serious offense. Um, Vasileva appealed to the Central Criminal Court and six weeks after her conviction, the Lord Chief Justice cleared her. Um, and it's quite remarkable that she was an anarchist, the partner of not only an anarchist, but one of the gang who had shot dead three police officers. And yet the Lord Chief Justice accepted evidence given on Vasileva's behalf that she was a respectable young woman. Uh, so Vasileva continued to live in London. In the late 1920s and 1930s, she worked uh, for Arcos, uh, the uh, Soviet government's trade delegation, which at, uh, at that time was involved in uh, allegations of espionage. MI5 tried to deport Vasileva again at that time, but failed. And she lived until as late as 1963 and was living on Brick Lane at the time of her death. But there's a mystery as well, because among the photographs that I found in the police archives is this one, completely unlabeled. Now, maybe I've got an overactive imagination, but doesn't this guy look like this guy? The other two photographs, one in the centre and one on the right, are of Saklatvala, Shabaji Saklatvala, the communist MP for Battersea in the 1920s. Saklatvala lived in the East End for a few years in the first decade of last century. Is that photograph on the left Saklatvala? And if so, why did some of the Latvian anarchists have a photograph of Saklatvala in their room? It's an open question. Maybe it's not Saklatvala. I've tried to do a little bit of digging to this. I haven't got any further. Uh, but I'm going to leave it at that. Um, my book, by the way, includes uh, two self-guided walks with maps. And I'm going to be leading a, a walk, actually, as part of the Hackney History Festival in May. Uh, the book is published by Reaction. It's hardback. It's illustrated. Uh, and it's only 15.99. And if you have any questions, I will do my best to answer them. Now, if I've, what I need to do now, though, is stop sharing. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we seem to have... Def oh, yeah, we got your live photograph back. You defaulted to a still. Uh, that was excellent, brilliant. And certainly having read the book, I would recommend there's a lot more in the book um, than obviously than Andrew could be covered in his talk. Um, so questions or comments... Um, if you uh, 
put, press the uh, reactions uh, button and put your hand up. Or if you don't know how to do that, uh, wave and we'll try and catch you. Uh, so who wants to go first? Uh, John Atfield. Just very, very quickly. Thank you very much. It was a really, really interesting talk. Um, did the police know that um, when they conducted the siege, that there were two gunmen or two people in the building? Or did they imagine it might have been a much larger number? They were fairly clear that there were two by the time the siege started. Um, so, and two reasons for this. The informer had actually been round to 100 Sydney Street. He met the two men. That's how he got the copy of the letter from Fritz Fars to pass on back to Latvia. So the informer, it's not entirely clear here who the informer was, um, would have told the police that there were two men. And also, um, the two men were staying in the room of a woman called Betsy Gershon, and they'd required Betsy to take her skirt off on the uh, bold assumption that mm -hmm. no respectable woman would appear in public without a skirt so that she wouldn't try and run away if she didn't have a skirt on. Um, but when they started the siege, the police managed to get the, the, the principal landlord and landlady who lived on the ground floor out. And then they had the job of trying to get Betsy Gershon out uh, before the trouble started. And what they did is they persuaded the landlady to go up and say, Betsy, Betsy, my husband's gone really bad. He's really ill. I need your help. Come down. So they did that. And Betsy Gershon came downstairs to supposedly help, uh, you know, look after her landlord. And she was then uh, grabbed by police, one of whom put a hand around her mouth, taken next door, and she was then required to say, who is in your room? And she would also have told the police that there were two people there, and she probably would have told them that, that they were armed. So by the time the trouble started, I think the police knew that they faced two adversaries, but they would also have been aware that their adversaries had um, at least two, in fact, we know three uh, fairly formidable semi-automatic weapons. Thanks. Uh, Chad Goodwin, you're next. Right, yeah. Something I'm I'm especially curious about around this time is that this, this period, I'm not suggesting that London was a hotbed of anarchism, but there were an awful lot of anarchists living in exile or, you know, in and around London at the time. So something, I've got your book, I haven't read it yet, but uh, I'm very curious about whether I think Peter Kropotkin was still in London at the time, yeah, Marika yeah. Malatesta yeah. was there. What did they have to say about the events of Sydney Street, if anything? Um, uh, Malatesta, in particular, was commissioned by Der Arbeiter Freund, the Yiddish speaking uh, weekly paper, um, to write an article about Houndstitch and Sydney Street, which did. He'd have written it almost certainly in French and it would have been translated and it was subsequently translated into French and English, Italian and English, sorry. Um, uh, Malatesta basically said uh, it's nothing to do with anarchism. What's this got to do with anarchism? Mm. How has robbing jewellery shops and killing police officers got anything to do with anarchism? He didn't express uh, a, a purely pacifist position, but he, he was really strong in his denunciation. Rudolf Rocker, who was the figurehead of the Yiddish speaking movement, he was actually interviewed by the Morning Post, so a right-leaning daily paper. And again, he was deeply critical of, um, of the Latvians. And Ro Rocker, in his own memoirs, tells this story about how a group of young Russian anarchists were planning a, an attack attempt uh, a, 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 they were planning to throw a bomb at the Lord Lord Mayor's procession which was part of the Lord Mayor's show and Rocker and his colleagues found out about it and they went to this group and they said don't do it it's absolutely counterproductive and Rocker's main argument was look we are able to live and operate in this country we can sell our papers we can uh, we can argue our politics. 
if you carry this out, we will lose the right of asylum here. That will be the re response of the government and the change in public mood. And that would be such a serious reverse for our movement. So don't do it. And according to Rocker's own account, and he's a fairly reliable uh, uh, chronicler, the youngsters gave up their plans to stage that bomb attack. Thank you. Very, very interesting, the whole thing. Right, who wants to go next? I can't see anybody waving or with a hand up at the moment. Right, in the absence of anybody else, um, I, I was interested in what was the response um, of, should we say, the indigenous uh, labour movement in terms of uh, the ILP and the British uh, Socialist Party. I mean, given that the ILP had actually published a very uh, supportive uh, booklet uh, on the Latvian revolutionaries in 1905, um, some of whom were also obviously involved in in Sydney Street, uh, although they'd by then they'd moved to moved towards anarchism. I'm just interested in whether there was any commentary given the. So should we say the pretty vitriolic response in the popular press? The I mean, justice certainly uh, was severely critical, as you would expect uh, the SDF BSP paper to be of anarchists. Um, actually, one of the people who was charged was Jacob Peters, mm. who was the cousin of Fritz Vars. Uh, and who was a member of the British Socialist Party, then called the Social Democratic Party. And in the search of his rooms, the police found his SDP membership card, which is also among the City of London police records uh, in the London Metropolitan Archive. And um, Jacob Peters um, said, he actually said it in, in a message from jail, but clearly trying to get that message out to the police, who were, of course, translating all communications that from uh, detainees sent from jail. He basically said, me? Really? They think I'm an anarchist? My cousin may be an anarchist. I fight anarchists. I'm against anarchists. I'm not with them. How can they be so daft? Uh, the one issue on which they coalesced was to, uh, trying to stop restrictions on the right of asylum. And then there was also, in the following year, there was an attempt to deport Malatesta, mm -hmm. not directly because of his, in, of his alleged peripheral involvement in, uh, in uh, the robbery attempt, supplying the gas cylinder, uh, but because he'd been convicted of a criminal libel of another Italian anarchist. And um, it was a coalition of socialists and radical liberals who mobilized to stop Malatesta being deported. His conviction was not overturned, but the, uh, the Home Office decided that they would not pursue extradition. So Malatesta eventually left of his own accord a couple of years later. Thanks. Um, Danny Evans, you're next. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Andrew. Very, very interesting. I've just got um, a comment on the last question that hopefully will lead into a question. Um, just in relation to the wider left's response to this. But, um, I've done a bit of, a little bit of research into the anarchist communist Sunday school that was set up in Liverpool um, by... Um, Lorenzo Portet and uh, G and Jim Dick, and um, I think it was within the aftermath of the siege of Sydney Street that the um ILP, which had lent the um anarchist communist Sunday school its rooms in in Tega Street, um, they closed it, their doors to to that uh, project. So I don't know if that was a direct consequence of the, the siege of Sydney Street, but it's it seemed to be, you know, the timing seemed opposite. And I know that you um, interviewed Jim Dick's future partner, Nelly, as well. And, and uh, it's like a, a wonderful interview on your um, website. And I was just wondering if, you know, that having spoken to people who have like that kind of lived connection with that, um, 
particular time um, and that kind of milieu. Like when you spoke to to Nelly, were you able to like make that kind of connection in your head, or did it seem like uh, remote? You know, from from this obviously extremely humane, um, you know, example of like the cosmopolitan left. I I I found uh, Nelly Dick's account absolutely transfixing. So Nelly was born Naomi Plashansky, uh, brought up in Stepney Green. She set up uh, the Anarchist Communist Sunday School, which was based at the Jubilee Street Club in London. Uh, she was a very active anarchist. She revered Rudolf Rocker. She helped to sell their Arbiter Freund, their, their Yiddish-speaking weekly paper. Um, I met her in New York State 30 years ago, and she was then just short of 100. Uh, she was 17 at the time of the siege of Sydney Street, um, and her memories were quite, quite acute. So um, she didn't approve of, of of what the Latvians did, but she'd met some of them in the Jubilee Street Club. In fact, she told this story that uh, a couple of the Latvians had asked if she would go round to their lodgings to help teach them English, and she said she would. But when she mentioned this to her mom, her mom said, there's no way you're going to their rooms. There's no way you're going to their rooms. If they want to come here, that's fine. So it didn't happen. She also mentioned quite, I mean, I, I didn't really pursue this as much as I should have done. I talked to her for about two hours and I got it all on tape. Um, but she also mentioned that her lodger um, at um, their home in Stepney Green was a guy called Sol Mars. And she said... He had um, he he wasn't he wasn't an anarchist himself, but he also knew these guys. And when they needed help, Sol Mars helped them. He helped to forge some papers, which made it easier for them to get out of the country without uh, being asked too many questions. And I sort of I didn't really follow up on that at the time, but of course since then the 1911 census returns have been made available, and in the 1911 census returns. Solomon Mars is indeed the lodger in uh, the Plachansky family rooms in Stepney Green. And but the other thing that she she mentioned was, and again, it's I mean, I was listening back to it, and it, it she also told this story that um, in the hue and cry after the hand stitch killings, she saw in the street one of the people who the police she thought the police were looking for. And she pretended not to see him because she didn't want this person to see her. She didn't want any eye contact. Why? She didn't want anybody to think that she might be an informer. So, you know, she she, she was quite clear. These guys were, they, they were sort of desperados. But there's one thing that you was worse, and that was to be an informer. And there was no way she was going to be informer and there was no way that she wanted anybody else to regard her as the person who might have passed on information to the police. So that's a sort of, that was just an indication of the sort of mood at the time, but she knew, she knew, she knew, yeah, she spoke to Kropotkin, Kropotkin came to uh, the Jubilee Street Club, she knew people like William West, she got a very vivid description of uh, rocker and of Malatesta. Malatesta was quite a regular in the Jubilee Street Club. And people like Guy Aldred, uh, you know, a London anarchist, um, he went to the Jubilee Street Club. Not many um, uh, sort of what you might call um, uh, non-migrant anarchists did go to the Jubilee Street Club, but Guy Aldred was, uh, was something of an exception. So it's a really, I mean, you know, I, I was, you know, feel very privileged that I was able to talk to somebody who had got those memories of a culture which I mean disappeared entirely with the outbreak of the First World War partly because quite a lot of the uh, anarchists in the East End um, eventually went back to Moscow because in the Bolshevik Revolution uh, you know the spark of change it wasn't an anarchist revolution but they supported it and they I mean even Rudolf Rocker tried to get back to Russia to uh, to support the revolution, and partly because quite a few were interned. 
as actually Rocker was himself as enemy aliens during the First World War. Thanks. I've got Francis King and then Rose Cook, but Francis first. Oh, yeah, fascinating talk, Andrew. One, one thing I was kind of uh, thinking about as you were talking about um, the uh, the cousin of one of these anarchists who was in the, uh, the Social Democratic Party, as it was at that time, it seems to me that in many cases those Russian Social Democrats who came over to, to, to Britain were keener to get involved with what they saw as the kindred social democratic movement in this country, joined the, joined the SDF and that sort of thing, and, and took part in, in, in kind of British politics. Um, whereas, certainly these, these anarchists you're talking about, it seemed that they were kind of carrying out Russian politics on British soil. Would you say that was a fair observation? Was it just uh, those, those particular uh, cases? That... I think it's absolutely fair of the, of the Latvians mainly Latvians who were involved in Houndstitch and, and Sydney Street, they had really, in essence, no contact at all with uh, people who didn't speak Latvian, Russian or Yiddish. Those were the range of languages that they, they spoke. Very few of them had any functioning English. Um, Nina Vasileva was an exception, but even her English was fairly rudimentary. Peter the Painter probably only spent about three months in London prior to Houndstitch and Sydney Street, and, and, and a lot of them were just passing through. Um, they weren't, you know, they weren't based in in London for the long haul. The extent to which any substantial number of people from Russia and the Baltic states got involved in the so what you might call the indigenous socialist movement. I think it was quite limited. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know of anybody apart from Jacob Peters. Well, I suppose there was Theodore Rothstein as well. Mm -hmm. um, as Duncan said, um, the ILP did publish um, a volume which was about uh, the Latvian progressive left nationalist movement. And I think that is the volume which has got an introduction by Ramsay MacDonald. That's correct, uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's quite a sign, isn't it, that, you know, somebody who was so prominent in the ILP, went on to be prime minister, was actually giving his, you know, moral support, I mean, clearly not to Latvians of the Peter the Painter mould, but to the Latvian leftist movement, and denouncing the repressive measures that the Tsarist authorities were conducting, and also, as I remember Ramsay MacDonald's introduction, denouncing uh, the British authorities for being uh, over vigilant in their monitoring of Russian and Latvian revolutionaries in the UK. I'd, I'd also add some of the people like Zelda Coates, Zelda Kahan Coates, yeah. Well. Yeah. And, uh, and also, I mean, as I said, which, uh, I'm involved in is uh, Peter Petrov, yeah. who was uh, heavily involved in the SDF from a Russian revolutionary okay. background. and. Uh, actually wrote, wrote his autobiography, which we are hoping to bring out sometime uh, mm -hmm. later this year or maybe next year. Uh, but but, but I, sus I suspect many more were involved in Russian and Latvian social democratic groups in London than were active in SDF, BSP, ILP. Mm. Probably, yeah. yeah. OK, Rose Cook, you're next. Thank you, Andrew. It was incredibly interesting. Um, I'd like to ask you, in any of the witness statements that you probably read in the in, in your archival research, um, did um, did any of the witnesses say why the um, gang wanted to rob Harris's jeweler's shop and what their plans were to do with the money uh, from the proceeds of the robbery? Uh, no, because. I mean, the, the key people were either dead or they were professing their innocence. So they were admitting they knew people involved, but they weren't saying they were part of the the robbery attempt. So there's, n there's no clear admission of guilt in any of the witness statements. And even the one or two people on the fringes of the group who were doing their best to give the police a fairly full picture of what they knew didn't really touch on, on motive. Um, However, um, I think I think it's possible to surmise that Peter the Painter's presence, Peter the Painter had been the treasurer of one of the Latvian 
very small Latvian anarchist groups, um, and was very well traveled. He had good French. He may have had some German. He certainly had Russian. He had Latvian. Um, it's quite possible that his presence in London was to be available to take the money out. Uh, the money would have been spent, well, some of the money would have stayed behind because I think some of those involved would have had sticky fingers. Probably not all were acting from political motives. It was a mixture of political and criminal motives. Um, but the, the bulk of the money would have gone to buy weapons for the Latvian movement inside Latvia and probably as important for the families of political prisoners who, you know, if you're, if you're you know, if your main breadwinner was locked up, you were destitute. So uh, the Latvian movement took quite a seriously their responsibility to the welfare of families of political prisoners. Thanks. Thank I think you. it's I think it's probably worth adding that I mean both Peter the painter and Svars were involved in expropriations in Latvia before coming to yeah. London, and that's covered uh, in much more detail in uh, Philip Ruff's book. Which is which is why Andrew didn't have to repeat that. Um, uh, anybody else? Um, can I just comment? They from the jewelers, the silversmiths. They wouldn't have been stealing money. They would have been stealing, presumably, um, jewelry, valuables, and so on. Um, that presumably means they must have had plans to deal with the logistics involved. You know, yes. they, either to smuggle that out of the country in the form of silver and jewellery, or they would have been able to sell it on to somebody they knew in London and convert it into cash, something like that. Is, is there any evidence along those lines? Um, there's little slivers of evidence. It's quite possible that some of the, the group uh, were involved in a robbery from a jeweller shop in Old Street the previous year. Sokolov actually had the keys to that jeweler shop so um and he was questioned by police sokolov being one of the two people who died in the siege of sydney street um th th there was there's been quite a lot of talk that the uh the gang had a uh, a fence lined up in the jewish east end indeed at roughly the same time as the siege of sydney street there was also the notorious clapham common murder and one of the this was a uh, a Jewish um, an East End Jewish property owner stroke businessman of a slightly dubious type who was found uh, clubbed to death in Clapham Common. And one of the theories that was worked on at the time and has kept popping up ever since is that this guy was uh, was was a fence and had been um, uh, lined up by the gang uh, to uh, market the proceeds of the jewelry, the robbery of the jewelry stop, sh store, uh, but the gang were worried that he would act as an informer, so they bumped him off. I don't think that's true, um, but nevertheless, that was knocking around. So, uh, and there were other suggestions that there were other people who had done some fencing type work for uh for the latvians it's not conclusive but the, what they also certainly did is they on occasions pawned stolen items of jewelry um individually but so sometimes um after the event uh some some pawnbrokers tickets were found in the room of one or two of the gang and when the police <laughs> retrieved the items they discovered that they were um uh, silver pocket watches in some cases, which had been stolen in Germany. Um, so it's possible that there was a network which was circulating jewellery around so they could be pawned at some distance from where the items were stolen, if you see what I mean. Right. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll just ask one more myself. Um, Malatesta's role, I mean, clearly, obviously, condemning um, the the activities of the Latvian anarchists, but nevertheless, I'm absolutely amazed that he was never actually charged for supplying the equipment that was actually used in the robbery. I mean, it did seem a, an opportunity to uh, deport him, and given he was actually very well known as, apart from Pr Kropotkin, the leading anarchist, international anarchist in the country at the time. Yeah, and the police, the police actually, or the, the 
generally the police actually rather revered Kropotkin because he was he was um, he was posh, he was genteel, he was completely unthreatening. He dressed fairly smartly. Malatesta, they thought, mm. was the devil incarnate because mm. he was shabby. He had this slightly mysterious backstreet engineering workshop in Islington. Uh, he was clearly much more of a rabble rouser than Kropotkin was. Um, and it is quite remarkable that Malatesta, I, I think I take it at face value, innocently mm. supplied this gas canister, a big gas canister, to the gang, which was delivered to them just hours before the robbery attempt. I think what saved him is that when the police tried to work out where did this gas canister come from, they went to the firm, uh, I mean, they knew from the markings on the canister which firm had supplied it. So they went to the firm and said, so who did you who did you sell this to? And the, the firm said, oh, um, Italian guy, we've got his business card. And they did have Malatesta's mm. business card. And I think even the police couldn't imagine that Malatesta, if he was part of a conspiracy uh, to commit a robbery of a jewellery store, would leave his business card behind when he was arranging for the supply of the gas canister. So um, they interviewed him. I think they had him twice mm. at the police station. Mm. They took him to um, ID parades. Yeah. But they never did anything more than that. And indeed, Rudolf Rocker says that when he heard about Malatesta's arrest and then Malatesta's release, Rocker rushed round to see his friend Malatesta. And Malatesta said to Rocker, the police were very good to me. Hmm. So, you know, they, they didn't mistreat me. Uh, I explained what I knew. They accepted it and they let me go. OK. Uh, interesting part of the story that which is in the book out tonight. Um, any any other comments or questions from anybody before we close the session? This is your last chance. All right. Yes, David. Oh. Goodway, David. You're on mute, David. Very much for a wonderful talk. And it's a brilliant book, which I thoroughly recommend. Thank you, David. OK, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. That's an endorsement from David. It's certainly worth putting on the back of the next of the paperback edition. Uh, 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 anybody else? <laughs> right. Any final comments from you, Andrew? Just to say thank you very much for your attention. Um, it's a uh, it pleasure and a privilege to talk to the social history uh, socialist history society uh, as i say of which i'm a long-standing yeah, member welcome, and thank you for for your interest well thank you very much andrew that was a, an excellent session and, and and do do buy the book everybody it's well worth reading um before we finish uh just to remind uh members or people who aren't members like uh, like andrew is uh you can join the socialist history society um, Steve Cushion, as, as always, has put the details of membership uh, on the screen for you. Um, uh, for the membership, you get a uh, Socialist History Journal, our academic uh, journal, uh, published twice a year. You get occasional publications uh, and you also uh, get uh, uh, newsletters uh, from us. Uh, also, obviously, notifications of all our events. Um, but since our events are nearly all online, uh, which you get for free. Uh, it would be really helpful for the Association for the Society if more people who came to our events online uh, joined uh, the, the Society um, so that we are uh, can keep our financial uh, viability. Uh, our, our next event um, is our annual uh, general meeting at the Marx Memorial Library on the 1st of June. We'll put timings and more details on the website soon. Um, but our main speaker at that event is uh, John Merrick, who has recently edited for Verso, uh, Raphael Samuels, uh, or some of Raphael Samuels' essays in Workshop of the World. And we have a number of people who knew or worked with Raphael uh, speaking, or were trying to get to, to join us at that event. So it's our formal annual general meeting for uh, members of the society. Um, but as always, it is open uh, to uh, everybody uh, to come uh, to that event so uh, look out for details on our website um, we're also of course encouraging members and non-members 
to uh, tell us uh, what they're up to, what research they're doing, what they're publishing, um, just keeping in touch because we want a lot more of our members to be more participating in the organisation as a whole. The Socialist History Society is, is for all of us um, and we would like uh, more offers of publications, um, for, especially for occasional publications uh, from uh, members and people who may wish to join the society. Um, David Morgan, our secretary, is in charge of occasional publications uh, and the newsletter. Uh, and Francis King, who is with us today, is our treasurer and also the editor of the Socialist History Society Journal. Uh, unless anybody's got anything to add, I think that's it. I'm just looking to see if any of our other officers uh, want to say anything. Uh, but otherwise, uh, thank you for participating and hoping to see you at the AGM or online at a future talk.